This whole week past was about Cain and his legacy. And it's interesting, it doesn't talk about Cain and Abel, it just says Cain and his legacy. What did he leave behind? And it's going to be quite shocking as we find out what he really did. Our memory text is taken from Genesis chapter 4 verse 7. And I think that will be a good one for us to look at. It says in Genesis 4 verse 7, and I'm reading out of the New International. If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Now, in this verse is packed a lot of information. And sometimes also, sadly, dear friends, and I'm going to bring this out, there is a danger in that very verse, that very command of Christ, the instruction that he was giving to Cain about dealing with the problem that he was encountering. I'm going to show you there's a subtlety there that we need to look at and clearly understand. Now, the author does some in incredible things in the lesson. Uh, the author of the you know, lesson, Courtly, and I'm always intrigued by what we see there, what we discover. And uh, I'm just wanting to make sure the people who are watching via live stream <laughs> can see me. I want you to see something there that the author starts off on Sabbath section by making a very interesting statement. We find, we have Revelation, uh, sorry, uh, Genesis chapter 3, which was the fall, which we discussed last week. Now we are basically looking at Genesis chapter 4, but then the interesting thing is that you had to look at 5, and you had to look at a little bit of 6. And I couldn't understand why, because the emphasis is to a great extent on Cain, and that is Genesis chapter 4. So what would be the purpose of looking at Genesis chapter 5, and to some extent up to Genesis chapter 6, sorry, chapter, um, uh, yeah, 6 verses 1, I think, through to, um, you had to look there, let me get it, 1 through to 5. What was the objective? What do we find recorded in Genesis chapter 5? You know, in the olden days, it would be so-and-so begat so-and-so. It used to be called the begats chapter. It's the lineage. But whose lineage? Abraham. No? Not Abraham, Adam. Adam's. <laughs> Adam's, but it's interesting that we don't have Cain recorded there. So why did we have to read Genesis chapter 5? Because it's got nothing to do with Cain. Cain is not brought out there. Seth is brought out there, but not Cain. Why was Abel not brought out there? Because he had been murdered. Okay, it's interesting. But then we don't have Cain being brought out as the son of Adam that was to follow. It was actually Seth. And we are going to look at this as we go on. But we find there an interesting thing. And that is that Genesis chapter 5 is actually only there for recording one thing. Simply. One thing. And that is that the prediction of Christ, the prophecy of Christ to Adam and Eve was, the day you eat of this tree, you shall surely die. Do you understand? What did the devil promise Eve at the tree? Immortality. He promised her immortality. You shall not surely die. So this, the struggle with this concept of living forever is something that we see here. This, we all want to live forever. Now, if you look at the world around us, what is everybody wanting to, to somehow avoid as much as possible? You want to avoid death. When we had the plague story, what did everybody tell you to go and do in order not to die? 
get the vaccination or avoid people or whatever. But there was this, this desire is to stay away from death. But what do we clearly read that took place for at least the first 2,000 years of life? Let's have a look at it. Go with me to Genesis chapter 5. And I want you to look. It starts off by saying, Adam lived 130 years. So we have the word live, which means there was life. He had been living for 130 years. Now that in today's time would be incredible. In actual fact, I think that the Queen of England would have to give you two kind of certificates or some kind of acknowledgement twice because hitting 100 is excellent, but hitting 130, that's really good. But in the case of Adam, at the age of 130, we find there that he has a son whom he names Seth. Now we know that that was not the first son. How do we know that? Because of Genesis chapter 4. We have Cain and we have Abel, and I'm going to get to that, but I want you to see something. It then says in verse 5, Altogether, Adam lived a total of 930 years. And then what does it say? And then he died. Somehow, when we achieve living for a period of, say, 80 years, we feel we've accomplished something. We've managed to outwit death for 80 years. A person who lives it for 100 years, man. And then we always look at little phrases like, 70 years is the average lifespan, but if you are honor your parents, if you are a good person, you will reach 80. But now if you're 100, you're really, really, really a good person. But if you got to, like Auntie Lorna, 106 Man, you were an exceptionally good person. Now, in the case of Adam, he reached 9,960 years, and then he died. 930. Man, you know, if we had to decide that life was dependent on how good you were, then somehow Adam was very good. Okay, but then you've just fallen into my trap. Okay. <laughs> the trap that you've just fallen into is that the reason why Adam lived so long was because he wasn't so bad as Cain. You know, dear friends, I want to make something very clear to you. Babies who are good in our world die. So if life was an indication of you being good, then the measuring stick here would be that Adam was. But you know that the interesting thing about Adam, he wasn't the oldest person who ever died. I thought that Methuselah was until I learned something. Let's go to Methuselah. Methuselah, if you look at verse 27 of the same chapter, chapter 5, it says, Altogether Methuselah lived a total of 969 years. That was 39 years longer than Adam. So he was really a good person compared to Adam. Do you see that? What is the ending story of even Methuselah? He died. So what was God's prediction? Was it accurate or inaccurate, his prophecy? It was accurate. You see, and I want you to understand something here, that in the purpose of Genesis chapter 5 is to let us see something. And that is that when God said to Adam and Eve, you shall surely die they did not believe that. They believed the lie. You will not die. But we have a record for over 2,000 years of people dying. Now this is just the record of the heads of each family. We're not even talking about the rest of mankind there. Just the heads. So the interesting thing is that the purpose of Genesis chapter 5 was to first of all reveal that God's prediction or God's prophecy was accurate. 
Do you understand? The next thing that we pick up about Genesis chapter 5 is that Cain is not recorded. Cain's not recorded there. But then we find something interesting in Genesis chapter 6. It talks there, when human beings, verse 1, began to increase in number on the earth, and the daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful. And now we all of a sudden have brought out in Genesis two categories. What are the two categories brought out in Genesis? The sons of men and the sons of God. We have the sons of God and the daughters of men. Interesting. Tell me a little bit about that. What are we talking about? The, 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 the sons of God were the, were the sons of Seth. And the sons of, of uh, men, the daughters of men, were the daughters of, of Cain. Very interesting. Wise observation there. Nice. They, they were killed in the flood. So I want you to see something here. That we have two groups of people and we have a mingling of evil and good. Initially they're separate. Initially separate. But then they started to mix. Now that is a danger when you start mixing. I want you to understand something that is very important to pick up here. Paul says that flesh and spirit do not mingle. You can't have from the same fountain sweet and bitter. And yet somehow we believe that we can coexist. Samson we, believed that also. Pardon? Samson believed that too. Samson believed it too. Poor Samson. <laughs> okay, but I want you to pick, pick up something. Although Samson believed it, we believe it too. We believe that we can coexist. I have seen so many times how that a young man or a young girl in the church would go out, find a companion, not of the same faith and we would think that they're going to win them to the faith and what happens in the end it's sad so the point that I want you to understand here is that God is bringing something home to us we cannot afford to be casual in how we go about living there can be no compromise if you do compromise there's a problem but you'll see why I'm bringing this all out. I want you to go to carry on looking with me. So we see here that in the case of Cain, he's not mentioned in Genesis chapter 5 because as you quite correctly brought out, he was the group of people that basically rebelled. Now, there's another person brought out and it starts with an L and it was the son of Cain. Who was it? Lamech. Tell me a little bit about him. What, what was the fruits brought out of Cain's life? Well, he brought out more than one uh, marriage, for example. Polygamy. Yes. What else? Yes, the interesting thing, he brags, he brags about his dad killing one, but he's killed many. Yes, he talks about God's mark against Cain. Remember the vengeance of God. If any person touched Cain, do you remember that? God would avenge Cain. But then he said, yeah, but God would avenge me more. You see, the danger is, somehow we're starting to feel that God tolerated Cain. And sin is somehow given... We're given license to sin more because God will be more forgiving. We get that seed planted by Lamech. It wasn't a seed planted by God. Do you understand? It's, I want you to see certain things. We're going to go on as, as, as we look at it. The other thing that's interesting about Cain is that he was the firstborn directly after sin. Can you tell me what actually was taking place when Eve gave birth to the son? 
Now it's there in Genesis chapter 4 verse 1. You had to read it. She gave birth. What was she longing for in the birth of Cain? The Messiah. The Messiah. And I want you to notice, if you go and look at it, and now it's not really brought out clearly in the translations because the translations loses it. But luckily, in your lesson, you could see more of that. And what did the word, what did, what did she say? I want you to look there in verse 1 still of Genesis chapter 4. Adam made love to his wife Eve and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord I have brought forth a man. Now, what does that mean? Now when you read that, you don't pick up anything there. You don't pick up that there is something that she's just said that because of the translation you missed it. What did she just say? Why? Yes. I'm asking a question. Yahweh. You do a good Yahweh. Mm -hmm. So what was that? What was she saying that she's just conceived? The Lord himself. The Lord himself. She, in her deliverance of Cain, in her pregnancy of Cain, considered that Cain was the promised Messiah. That's what she considered. If you go back to the original language, it's very clear that she says, I have given birth to the Lord, to the Messiah. Why can she say that? Why did she God say that? The Pardon? God the I need more than that. Do you remember? Now, I think some of you missed out on this, maybe. I'm not sure. But last week's lesson, Adam calls his wife Eve. Why does he call her Eve? Because she would be, as we see there, the mother of all living. If you go with me to verse 29 of Genesis chapter 3, it says, Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all what? Living. Very interesting. Listen to this, dear friends. What did Adam pick up in Calling his wife Eve. What did he pick up on even though Eve was cursed by pain in childbearing? That she would bring forth life. On what grounds does Adam say this? That she will bring forth life. Dear friends, you can't miss this. There's a lot of things happening here about prophecy that is actually being fulfilled right there in the beginning. God said, the day you eat of this tree, you shall surely die. We get the record, they started to die. God said in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15, what does he say there? I will put enmity between you, and he's talking to the serpent, and the woman between your offspring and hers. What was God saying? That life was going to come from the woman. Do you understand? Adam picks up on this and calls his wife Eve because he recognizes the promise made in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 that out of the woman life would come. So when she gives birth to Cain, her first reaction is, I've given birth to life. And that Cain, honestly, was the Messiah. She thought that he was the promised one. Quite tragic. I'm going to explain this as we go. Yes. So. How often do we... Well, the sad thing is, as you say there, yes, yes, but the sad thing, she wasn't even around when the life came from her. 
I want you to notice something. Please go with me to Luke. Now, you didn't have to do this, but it's just to show you certain things. To help you to understand why it is that she behaved in a certain way. And then when we talk about, um, about um, Abel, his, the interpretation of his name is he's just a breath. He's almost insignificant. Why is he insignificant in her own eyes? Because he came after Cain. And Cain, as far as she was concerned, was the promised Messiah. And Abel was just a vapor. Well, the sad part is he didn't live long enough because according to her, her Messiah killed her, first, her second son. You can see what this is so shocking about. We sometimes look to Messiahs as those who are going to save us, only to find out they're going to kill us. And I want to tell you, dear friends, the world is preparing for a Messiah. And it's one that's going to seem as if he's got the well-being of people, but his intent will be to take their lives. I want you to go with me. I want you to go with me to um, Luke, please. I want you to see something, questions that can be asked, answered at another time. It's, I won't be able to do it now. Luke chapter 3. We have the genealogy of Christ. Now, what did Jesus say about himself in John chapter 14? I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus acknowledges very clearly that he is the life that Eve was going to give birth to. The woman. Do you understand? Now I want you to look at something interesting. In Genesis chapter, uh, Luke chapter 3, we have the genealogy of Christ. And it starts off by saying, 23, When Jesus himself was about 30 years old, when he began his ministry, he was a son, so it was thought of Joseph. Now this is so interesting that there is this hint given that the general population considered that Joseph was his dad. But we know that Joseph wasn't his dad. Isn't that true? Who was his dad? Our Heavenly Father was his dad. Okay. Who was his mother? Mary, without a doubt, was his mother. Okay. But then I want you to know Joseph was the son of Eli, the son of Matai. And we go right down. And I want you to go to the very last verse, verse 38. The son of Enos, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. Luke chapter 3. Now I want you to consider this with me. What did God promise to Eve, Adam and Eve in the garden? That she, the woman, would give birth to the Messiah. That the Messiah would crush the heel of the serpent, uh, the head of the serpent, but that the serpent would strike his heel. That is this. Well, that's interesting. Again, she was the mother of the living. Okay, you're going to see this. This is very important to pick up. That she considered, and it's natural, dear friends, it was natural. I mean, when Eve, sorry, when Mary is approached, she actually asks the question, how can this be? And the angel declares it. Now, most people don't realize it, but this genealogy is not really the genealogy of Joseph. It's the genealogy of Mary, the woman. That's what's recorded in Luke chapter 3. Because I want you to notice, but I'm just showing you this. In Matthew, and jump with me to Matthew, please. We also have the genealogy, Matthew chapter 1. But the genealogy found in chapter 1 starts off with verse 1 by saying, 
This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Do you see that? Whereas we started the genealogy in Luke with Jesus and we ended off with who? With Adam who was the son of God. Okay, but then I want you to notice, if you look at this one, we go right through down to, um, and it's actually reversed. I want you to go to verse 16. It says, And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary was the mother of Jesus, called the Messiah. Now just who is the father there of Joseph? Anybody tell me who's the father of Joseph recorded there? Jacob. Do you see that? Is it, do you all see that? Okay, who was the father of Joseph in Luke? Who was the father of Joseph in Luke? Now look again. It says there, uh, sorry, you're right, I apologize. It was the son of Heli. Now, was he the son of Heli or was he the son of Jacob? <laughs> In, he was the son of Jacob, without a doubt. Because the record in Matthew was to determine the genealogy of Joseph. But there's a reason. But I don't want to get caught up with that. The point that I wanted to bring out was that for, for the woman in the beginning to consider that the firstborn that she gave birth to was the Messiah wasn't a stupid concept. It was a reality to her. And the sad thing is there's lots of things that come out as a result of this. The, the, the bad part about it all her anticipation of Cain being the Messiah, must have, her dreams must have been shattered when Cain killed his brother Abel. Because he took life where she gave life and the promised Messiah would give life. So I want you to see there's some very interesting, I'm going to expand on it as we go on, but I would like you to now go with me to we have the two brothers this is um th sunday section we have the two brothers and i wonder how many of you have ever taken notice of first of all we've got the two brothers names which we've just discussed cain meant more the messiah seth meant more sorry um abel meant more <laughs> insignificance no, it doesn't mean Messiah, but it points to, she, yeah, she thought, but it, correct, the name for that. So thank you. Her giving him the name Cain was that he was going to be the life source. Abel, insignificant, just vapor. But then we get the the two, the one brother kills the other brother. But the next thing we, we pick up in Genesis chapter 4, after being introduced to the two sons, what is the interesting thing about the two sons? They've got differences, names already. What else? The occupation. So let's deal with that first of all. Abel was what? He was a shepherder of sheep. Okay. Cain? Was he was a vegetable farmer. A grain farmer maybe or whatever, but he was a vegetable farmer. Now it so happened that one day they decide to bring an offering to the Lord. Which was already understood that in order for sins to be forgiven, what must be shed? Blood must flow. Okay. But now I want you to understand this. Who has the advantage here already in the offering? Abel. Abel has the advantage. Why? 
Now, by rights, he brings the best of his fruit without blemish, which the best, best of his produce. Isn't that true? And God looks in favor on his, but Cain brings the best of his produce without blemish in that. But God doesn't look in favor on that. It's not his. Pardon? It's not Abel's flock. It's not Cain's produce. Okay, that's true. But in the record here, we have that the one's a farmer. Uh, hang on, but you jump, you, you're starting to assess certain things. I'm taking, first of all, point blank, looking at them. Yeah. We see the one is a shepherd. But not of his own sheep. Of sheep. Not of his own, said they were his sheep. Okay, um, it's, <laughs> it's true. Now, Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. It's like if I work the soil and I plant the seed and I reap the harvest, who does it belong to? Your father. Okay, that's true, but it doesn't really belong to him. But you're splitting a hair here. I don't want us to split a hair yet. Yes. There are actually four offerings. Two were to make by God, blood, blood offering for both of them. And secondly, the next offerings, the thank offering. Okay, but you go, You see, now you're starting to talk. I don't read that there. No, 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 and yet. You, you can, I hear you, but I want you to say, I'm reading the text. I'm reading Genesis 4. How can you tell me all of this with just Genesis 4? It almost looks like when you look at Genesis 4, it almost seems that Abel was so lucky that he was a, a shepherd and Cain was unfortunate because he was a vegetable farmer. And there's a reason why I'm saying this. Dear friends, there's a lot of people who grow up and say that that person had an advantage on me because they were already in the right place doing the right thing. Cain happened to be the person who wasn't in the right place and not doing the right thing. And we tend to look at this and say, so God favored, because I want you to understand here, when I read this, the word, and I'm reading it like you read it, and I know how you're reading it, but I want you to understand something here. When I read this, it says, Abel also brought an offering, fat portions, from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and on his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. I'm reading about offerings here. I haven't got all this information. You are now supposedly already have. I want to take this way. If you only had the book of Genesis here, you would really have to be very careful in the way in which you are now trying to analyze why God looked in favor on Cain's. But God also on, on Abel, sorry. Hmm? God also gave Cain the opportunity of saying why he was angry or why he was. It wasn't cast judged. Well, it's true. You, you started to touch on something I'm asking you to look at. If, you, if I just... Dear friends, I don't know if you're mixing enough with people that ask this question. When you look at it here, it really seems that Abel had an advantage. He happened to be a shepherd farmer. Cain wasn't. But he did bring the best he had. Yeah. You want to you can speak? Also, another component could have been Cain was too proud. Well, you see, you're starting to, to say certain things. But you see, we have to. Dear friends, I want you to understand, when you look at this, there's a lot of information that is not written down. Just let me, there's a lot of information that's not written down. Listen to what I'm saying to you. First of all, who's writing this? Moses is. Was Moses sitting there next to Cain and Abel looking at them? What's he doing? Where was, where was Moses? What was he actually doing? He was in the desert looking after sheep. He was in the desert looking after sheep. 
also true. Thousands of years later, true. Carry on telling me. I'm asking you now. What's happening? How many books did he write? Okay, that's interesting. What is one of the books that we find there that is so important? Wasn't six books? No, he wrote four. But I don't want to get too caught here. There was five, they call it the Pentateuch, which is the five books, okay, of the Torah. But what are the five books talking about? It's giving you detail. Let me explain something. In Leviticus, what is the purpose of the book of Leviticus? What is the purpose of the book of Leviticus? It's to tell you certain things. What was the book of Exodus all about? To tell you certain things. What are we being elaborated on? What has been elaborated on in the other books that we do find? I mean, let me ask you this. That we're celebrating, or we don't celebrate it, but the Jewish people are celebrating the Passover. Please tell me, what do they learn about the Passover? What was the instruction given to them? To take a lamb, how old was it supposed to be? They had to look after it for a certain period of time and then they had to slaughter it. What is this? Did this lamb, did you break its legs? Did you, um, did you, uh, I'm just trying to think what else you would have done. Did you mix unleavened bread with it? Do you understand? How do you know that this was all part of the whole story? Because we have the information later. But dear friends, I want you to understand that that information was already available to Cain and Abel. Because it is from, from what we gather. Well, let me just make it even a little bit more. Look at Luke chapter, sorry, Genesis chapter 3. I want to ask you, what did Adam and Eve clothe themselves with? Adam and Eve clothe themselves with? With fig leaves. What does God do? Makes it out of skin. Do you all know that? Can you please tell me what skin it probably was? Animal, correct, because that skin comes from animals. Any specification of what animal it could have been? A lamb. Do you understand? Already, the, yes. In some sense, yes, but I, I want to touch on something that Simon was saying a little early on. Did, and I know you're going to be a little bit surprised by this question, but I'm going to ask you, did Abel only bring a lamb? No, no he brought vegetables as well. He brought vegetables as well. Thanks, it's a thanks offering. That's correct. But how do you know that? How do you know that? It doesn't say that there. No, it's because the lesson study told you that. Isn't that true? Because the lesson study does tell you that. You see, the point that I'm trying to bring out here is you cannot, just by reading this, understand the complicatedness of what was really going on. One would almost start having a little bit of empathy towards Cain. If you didn't have the information, you are all telling me. You see, and I want you to understand something, dear friends, from what I learn here, is we have to be very careful in the way in which we judge people because we don't know how much they really know. From looking at this, it almost seems as God favored Abel, but he hated Cain. We have verses that come out in Scripture where people use it. How do we feel about, how did God feel about Esau? And how did God feel about Jacob? That's what we read. And straight away there's a problem because of the misinformation. Dear friends, let me use one that you, you should recognize. When was the Sabbath given to mankind? 
the Sabbath truth given to mankind. Right here in the beginning, Genesis chapter 2. When is it recorded for the first time? In Exodus chapter 20. Do you understand? And yet they've been keeping it all along. Let me ask you this. When did they do sacrifices? When did they start figuring out bull sacrifices, a day of atonement sacrifices, sin offerings? And when did they actually start knowing all of that? In the beginning. It's known in the beginning. I mean, I'm going to ask you, when does the Passover service come? Before Exodus or after Exodus? How do they know when the Sabbath was in the beginning? It becomes before Exodus. Isn't that true? So, Exodus chapter what? 12. Okay, in Exodus chapter 12, we have the Passover service being given. What is taught in the Passover service? The lamb offering. Without blemish. All of that's given there. I want to ask you, when is it actually recorded? In, in Leviticus and in Deuteronomy, well, more in Leviticus than any other place. But where was it actually already practiced in Eden? Pardon? Sorry? Because God had instituted it already. So the point I'm trying to make, you need to listen to what I'm trying to show you here. That we have a record of something, but there's a, you need to read between the lines. You have to read between the lines. And the only way you can read between the lines is if you have more information given to you from other sources. Yes? I was, really, I was quite amazed how merciful God was to Cain. And I read, 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 read. For example, um, if you look at verse um, 8. Okay, verse 8. Now Cain talked with Abel, his brother. Now, what does that tell us? It was some conversation. Um, Cain didn't just go... Some what do you see? I love that. Carry on. And also, when Cain begged after he was given his punishment, oh no, 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 I'm not, I'm not happy with your government. Now, this, this verse 13, yes. Surely he me out in this day and cries to the Lord, blah, 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 blah. And then the Lord has mercy on him, says, what well, he says there about putting a mark on him and protecting him. So he's showing mercy. I want you to understand something. Is it possible that Cain could still have been saved? Without a doubt, dear friends. Multiple times. So the point I'm trying to bring out, what we are looking at is sadly a revelation of a person who was stubborn. Like Pharaoh, whose heart was hardened. But you don't see that straight away unless you start looking at other stories recorded in the Torah. For example, when God says to Abraham, take your son and what must he do with him? I want to ask you, that's the word sacrifice is used here. Do you hear that? But when do we actually find the recordings of a sacrifice again? Before Abraham or after Abraham? A, a written recording of the way in which you carry out the sacrifice. After Moses. But Abraham came before Moses. How did Abraham know about sacrifices if it wasn't recorded? Dear friends, because it was transferred verbally. It was something that wasn't written down. A lot of what we're reading here, you have to get the rest of the word to kick back. I mean, you all just assumed when we said that out of the woman would come, you know, out of the woman would... God was going to bring forth a child out of the woman. And we all, because we have Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, we can look back and say, oh, that's what God was saying in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. But you would not have been able to say that if you didn't have a knowledge of it beforehand. So the point that I'm trying to make here is, it is very clear just from the context that God had already revealed to both brothers what he was requiring of them. And interestingly, 
that most of you came to this conclusion because <laughs> you had to <laughs> that Abel brought a vegetable sacrifice also. But it doesn't say that. It doesn't say that. So the point is, yes. You can see that in Genesis 4 verse 8, it says the Cain talked with his Abel's brother and when they were alone working in the field. So that tells you that Yes, so what I'm trying to show, and I think the important thing is here, sometimes when we read, we have to be very careful what we read. You know, there's an old, well, Christ actually turns to a lawyer one day. When the lawyer asked him, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus asks him a question. What's the question she, he asks him? Pardon? No, well, it's... the. Yes, the lawyer, but he says to the lawyer, and there's a, I don't have time to take you there, but he turns to a lawyer who asks him, what must I, well, it's both of them, but the lawyer doesn't ask, he asks, the lawyer said he actually asks, what is the greatest commandment? Sorry, what is the greatest commandment? And then Jesus asks him, how do you read it? Did you hear me? And dear friends, I want to tell you, a lot of us are reading things into something that's not there. And a lot of us are leaving out, out stuff that is there that we're not reading. Did you hear me? Did you hear me? It, should, it should concern you. Why should it concern you? If you didn't have anything more than Genesis chapter 4, what would you need desperately if you didn't have anything else except Genesis chapter 4? Sorry? Somebody said something? The Holy Spirit. Definitely. You would need a divine influence to tell you what is right and wrong. The purpose of the Holy Spirit was actually given to you to instruct you in truth. So the point I'm trying to make here again, dear friends, if you just rely on the letter of the law, you are in serious trouble. Did you hear me? Because you can't see the spirit of the law. You see, in the New Testament, we find Christ coming and saying, it has been written, thou shalt not kill. But when you read that, you think that killing means you're not taking a physical life. But then Christ brings out the spirit of the law. If you think hatred towards your brother, what have you done towards him? I'm going to ask you something. How did Cain feel about his brother Abel? He hated him. So what do we already find out, if you just read carefully into here, that he was already thinking of murder? So the point I'm trying to make, dear friends, is don't be quick to judge an action until you really have studied it properly. But now we need to move on. That is just looking at the two sacrifices. And I'm so glad that the conclusion is both of them had to bring a lamb. Both of them had to bring a thanks offering. But we only have record of able bring in a lamb but now we the interesting thing those two are taken out and we've we've gone through the offerings we're now on tuesday's section and that was interesting to me tuesday's section asked the question or it has the heading what is the crime what is the crime it says the crime you need to help me what is the crime So you tell me what it is now. I need to know what was Cain accused of? Disobedience. Well, disobedience to God's word, but that's not exactly the thing. <laughs> Dear friends, a little bit more there again. I mean, can you just listen? Let's go back and look at it. The Lord asks him in verse 6, because we're trying to identify the crime. Dear friends, I'm going to catch you because you are a Cain. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Now already we know that anger is not a good thing to have. 
Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do, do not do what is right, sin is crouching at the door. It desires to, to have you, but you must rule over it. Now, just a point here. What do we tend to do that God counsels here, but we make it a means of salvation? God counsels Cain when he says, Sin is crouching at the door, but you must what? Must it rule over you or must you rule over it? You must master it. What's another word for mastering something? Overcome, but I need... What, do I, what did you say? Man, that little lady up in the peanut gallery is saying a lot of good things. Self-control. I want you to understand that we say to people, you must have self-control. God was saying to Cain, yeah, you want to do something that's wrong, sin is crouching the door, but you must rule over it. Dear friends, how many of you have been told you need to stop doing this and you need to stop doing that, you need to rule over it, and you keep falling? There's not one of you sitting here that hasn't fallen. I mean, we go, and you know, our church is a church that tells people to have self-control. And then all of you sitting here think you've got self-control because you were baptized into our church. You know that self-control is a gift from God. Galatians 5, correct. You see, what Cain needed to have self-control here wasn't to have self-control. You know, I used to help people to stop smoking. They would walk into the clinic. Some would there would be two chain smoker groups. The one would say, no more. They would walk and they would never touch a cigarette again. The other person, exactly strong, strapping, strong will, no more. They walk outside, they light up another cigarette. Then we would say to the one, ah, the one's got self-control. The other one's just controlled by self. Is that fair? You see, coming back to the story of Cain and Abel, we don't read between the lines. What was God saying that Cain needed when he said to him, you need self-control? What was he saying he needed? He, he needed the power of God. But he didn't see the need for the power of God. Just as he didn't see the need for the sacrifice. We see in his life already that he was self-reliant. He didn't need God. That's what we see. It creeps out. But now I'm going to show you this. Because you might say, uh-uh, what are you talking about? Remember God said to him, you must be, you must, sin is crouching at the door, but you must control it. Now ask the question, what's the crime? The crime is that Cain rebukes God's, um, rebukes what God tells him. And he goes to his brother and expects his brother to obey him as well. Interesting, you study. <laughs> There's some interesting things coming out, but take it a little bit, one step further. Because I want you to hear this. Cain, we know this, kills his brother. Isn't that true? So we, we, we would say that the, the crime was murder. Wouldn't we say that? He murdered his brother. But that's not what his crime was. Listen to this, dear friends. I want you to notice... He comes to Cain and he says to Cain, to sorry, to, no, to Cain, I want you to, to Cain, verse 10. The Lord said, what have you done? Now he's tried to identify the crime. Now he knows what the crime is, but does Cain know what the crime is? Of course he does. Listen, listen to this, and listen to the choice of words. Your brother. Man, you should start picking up on this. Your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. What has he just said to Cain there? Where's your brother? 
What's his response to that? Am I my brother's keeper? What was his crime? What was his crime? He did not recognize that he was his brother's keeper. Dear friends, we are counseled so clearly that we are to love our brothers. We are to love our neighbors. We are, and our crime is, that we don't love them. And we hate them, and we do all kinds, we steal from them, we do all kinds. So our crime is that we don't love our brothers. We don't see ourselves as the guardians of our brothers. Am I my brother's keeper? Yes, you are. That you get why I pointed out to the who owns the sheep. Okay. Yes. Same where it started. Exactly. Okay, you want to elaborate on it? That he came in multiple ways, separated himself, took things for granted, took it as his, and it started with his father's sheep and the vegetables. So what are you saying? Now that I've shown you this, can you read between the lines now more? Do you see certain things between the lines that you didn't see before? Dear friends, I want to ask you, how many of you are bringing sacrifices to God every day? And you feel happy with the sacrifice you brought, but it's not what he's asked for, first of all. And then your greatest crime wasn't that you brought a bad sacrifice or a wrong sacrifice. Your greatest crime was that you did not love your neighbor. That's his greatest crime. And when you stop loving your brother, all other crimes come in. You can then talk about your brother behind his back, which means you bear false testimony. You can dishonor your father and mother because you have no love. The interesting thing, the greatest crime against mankind is that we have stopped loving God and stopped loving one another. That's what we read here.